Wake up, buy your payer people. It's a beautiful day. Go grab yourself another cup of joe and say hello to Jim and Michelle Rhodes on the Buy Here, Pay Here morning show. Take it away, you two. Hi, everybody. Um, we, uh, we're we here with a special broadcast, um, special recorded broadcast with Gordy Tromolin. Did I say that right? Pretty close. Pretty yeah. close. <laughs> Good job. Uh, yeah, thanks. And uh, <laughs> we, we had actually gotten through about... Uh, um, about 20 minutes of uh, recorded with Gordy and realized that um, none of our mics were recording anything. <laughs> so so we're going to do this again. So we had a really beautiful um, run through just, you know, to kind of see what it is that we were going to talk okay. about. And we're uh, broadcasting um, here at NIADA. And Gordy is in between meetings and sessions and has um, graciously... Um, uh, done this with us a couple of times <laughs> and given us a bit of his time so we really really appreciate it it's okay he still remembers and he's still a smart guy so we're yeah we, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll go through this again so so gordy i think what we want to make sure that our listeners who haven't met you we want to first give them a little background because you um you bring the perspective as a former franchise dealer uh you have come from a family of franchise operators right and uh, and then also buy here pay here dealer and um now executive management with uh, NIDA and leadership there. So you want to kind of give folks the background on your... <laughs> sure, Jeff, happy to do so. So um, the Tormolin family started in the car business in 1940. My dad started as a gopher in a Hudson dealership and right eventually on. became the uh, the youngest Hudson dealer in North America. Um, did that for a while. Uh, Hudson shut down. He had a used car lot. Um, that shut down in a recession time in 1963. And so he then managed in, in several new car stores, got fed up with management, decided he's going to sell, sell cars and have fun. That's all he's going to do. Right on. Yeah. 18 months later, he was general manager of a Chevrolet store and bought it three years later. Nice. Yeah. Um, and, and I came into play um, in 1973 as he was managing that Chevrolet store. And at the time I was too young to get a work permit. So he paid me 50 cents an hour in his pocket. Yeah, yeah. Dad, Dad was a big Generous, spender. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he got himself in trouble in that one too, because I was also a good saver. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I was... Gosh, could not have been more than a couple months in, and and they took in a Cushman meter made cart from the city, and they bought squad uh -huh. cars from it, and I knew they had twenty five bucks in that thing, and so I bugged him in, bugged him in, bugged him in. Finally, he he let me buy it, and I I was a body shop apprentice at the time, and so I braised the fenders back together, and I sanded down, painted it bright red, sold it for two fifty. I thought I was J P Morgan. Yeah, yeah, of course. At the, uh -huh. you know, and by the time I got my driver's license, I was on my 21st So, car. so that was before yeah. you were 16. You that was age 13. At 13. Yep. Wow. Yeah. yeah, that's great. That's amazing. So was, I, I did that for a long time. I, I worked in the store. I learned, I worked my way up through all of the different positions of body shop in the, in the service department as a B grade tech, um, worked on the service counter, delivered part, fastest parts delivery service in all in Northern Illinois. Nice. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, learned how to be a counterman, um, sold cars, leased cars, did finance, all of that. Um, and then dad sold the Chevrolet store to his partner in 83 and we bought a bankrupt Chrysler store. Started with 10 employees and he and I was a total partnership kind of thing. He, he ran the backside and I did the front end and, mm -hmm. and sales managed and F&I and everything else. And we eventually we had three locations and 72 employees before we sold the franchise. And when we did that, the, the guy that, that bought it didn't want anything to do with my little used car lot that was by here payer. Ah, I ain't dealing with the Mickey people. It's okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> you go right ahead. And, you know, I, I, I transitioned, we went up and, and we restarted the buy here payer, started as a one man operation and built it up. We've got about 10 employees now, sell 15 cars a month. We're just humble and lovable. Mm -hmm. But I make more profit selling 15 cars a month in a well run buy here payer operation than I did selling 120 cars a month in a fully franchised yeah. Chrysler store worth 300 grand a month in overhead. Yeah. Probably a lot less stress. Yeah, a little bit. Well, <laughs> yeah. my, my hair still turned gray, but I yeah. do have a car. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah, no, that's part of it. So go ahead. Michelle. No, I just, uh, <laughs> we all turn gray. It's just part of getting older. <laughs> yeah. At least it hasn't abandoned me yet. So. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, and I just think we can carry on with the uh, part about, I, I share with you that I really kind of want to think about this whole conversation when I think about what's happening with the association. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about your role in leadership with the association, how you came to be in that. And we'll talk about what that really means what, to buy here, pay here in terms of challenges that we face now. So might just give our audience the, the background on your introduction to 
leadership with the sure. association. Sure. So one of the things that happened as I went to a smaller operation was my little corporate brain is still wiggling around here while I've got less to do. Mm -hmm. And so we got involved heavily in our church. And then thereafter, um, I, I joined the association and in 08 was asked to join their board of directors. Mm -hmm. And I, I, man, I prepared a resume. I was right out. I thought, you know, this is a high mm -hmm. fluting kind of deal. <laughs> Well, turned out they're pretty casual about things and <laughs> dealers are very like, independent. Yeah. It's like, dude, we'd love to have you join <laughs> well, us. Yeah. They're like, resume? What, what do I do with that? And then, yeah. He's I found its way to a circular file. <laughs> Oversells, right. But, uh, I, you know, from that, um, when, when I became president of the association, I went to the president's meeting down in Dallas where they train you up on your responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Cause this is a different animal. It's a, it's a, a not for profit and you have to understand how to, what yeah. are your, what your legal obligations are and how to well run it and so forth. And while I was at that meeting, I'm, I'm not very good at staying quiet when I have an idea or a thought. And apparently that impressed one or two people. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next thing I know, I was asked to join the, the national board in 2012. Good. Started as a regional vice president. I've held that position for several different occasions. Also have served as, as secretary and as treasurer in this past year as senior vice president. I was just elected. Now I'm, I'm now in president elect. Mm -hmm. So very good. That's exciting. It, yeah. it is. What, well, what happens? It should be scary for the dealers out there. <laughs> <laughs> so talk to me about what that means to now at the national association level and what it really means, especially for our buy here, payer listeners. Like what are you seeing um, that the association's involved in as it relates mostly to buy here, payer? I, the association's involved in so many things. Sure. You know, it started in 1946 as a legislative based mm -hmm. association. Mm -hmm. We were, we were at that time fighting Congress, which wanted to regulate used vehicle prices. So I get, yeah. can you imagine calling your congressman to see if you can, get a little extra money for that 2012 right. cruise that you're taking in on yeah. trade today. I mean, just, just a, a crazy idea, right. but of course it's expanded and, and in the association to provides relationships with vendors, it provides training and so many more things for dealers. Mm -hmm. And I, I think as, as we enter what will likely be a pretty tumultuous market for maybe mm -hmm. six months, maybe two years. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that training is of great value to everyone. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we're talk we're, we're specifically focused on buy here, pay here, but even retail dealers. Yeah. Can you imagine an environment where, you know, you got to kill something this week or you're not going to eat. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of stress to that and to have training and support means everything. Right. Yeah. Well, um, we, we had the opportunity of listening to Bob, Bob Altman, um, address in the beginning mm -hmm. of the opening, um, opening part of opening the session, uh, yeah. opening session. Thank you. <laughs> opening session of the conference here and, um, really appreciated, uh, how he presented where we're at um, and where we're going. And I really loved the analogy of the um, the quilt. He used an analogy of that everyone in this industry would buy here, pay here, independent, whatever, are, and vendors included are all pieces of a quilt. And they're different shapes and different sizes, different colors, different textures. And we're all so uh, um, an integral part of this whole industry. Yeah. And I mean, I thought it was really, it was very beautiful that he would use that kind of analogy. I think he's, Bob really understands the industry. He really uh -huh. does. He studied it before he got this job and he, he knows about it and, and understands it. And, and, you know, we, on the board, we sometimes catch flack because, oh, you're too retail or are you too buy here, pair focus? We have to understand that in a, in a free market in the United States of America, we are all engaged in the process of providing enough value to the customer that mm -hmm. they will freely give us their money mm -hmm. for the transportation, the value we provide. Now there are 47 different ways to, I mean, mm -hmm. to, to, to slice that pie. Uh -huh. There are people that only sell trucks or only sell high lines or classics. There's buy here, pay here, lease here, pay here, secondary finance, mm -hmm. CPO. I mean, you know, there's, there's just so many ways mm -hmm. to, to you pick your market mm -hmm. and, and work and make a profit at it. Yeah. And one thing that I, I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot of dealers out there that haven't taken the opportunity to join NIADA or state or their state associations. Um, that I hope that they realize that regardless of whether or not they join, that NIADA is working for them because they're working for the industry, and and that it's um, the 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 plug for join mm -hmm. is. Once you join, it, one one part of that is your dollars will go towards helping um, the, uh, the legislation and and Absolutely. all of the all of those pieces. But you also have such a rich amount, uh, rich offerings from the from the organization 
for training, for help, you know, in the state side, that if you're in the state of Florida, that you should check them out because they're going to tell you, you need to make sure you do this. You need to make sure you do that. And it's, and it's, they're there as like the best resource for how you do, how you do this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a funny thing, you know, and, and, and when you talk about independent automobile dealers, mm-hmm. the, the key there is independent. Mm-hmm. They are extremely independent. You know, mm-hmm. I've gone on, you know, membership drives where you walk into a guy's store and you look here, we're, you're the association. Here's what we do. Boom, boom. And they don't throw you out. You know, I'm not going to give you $349 for, you know, and others are willing and happy. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the National Association is a very interesting tool on their website where you can actually calculate the value of membership based mm-hmm. upon what you do for parts and what you're running credit yeah, card and everything else. I, I, I've mathed that one out a couple of times. In Illinois, I pay $299 to be a member of the association. I get $28,000 in tangible financial benefit from that set aside legislative support, training support, mm-hmm. all of the rest of it. Mm-hmm. And yet we have an industry where we've got about 15,000 members in the association where there are 40,000 dealers out there. Mm-hmm. They're a part of this industry. Mm-hmm. They don't, they don't know what they're missing. Right. Yeah. You know, and it's, that's critical. I mean, when, you know, we go to Washington, it's like, you know, we're representing 40,000 dealers, not just 15. Yeah. A fraction. And, and you know, I don't know what kind of math you want to put on how many employees they have, but that's gotta be half a million people. Sure. Mm-hmm. That are directly affected by this industry. Right. Yeah. And then it's there's huge. the engagement piece of that because you talk about 15,000 on the roster, but the only fraction of those people here getting the benefit of this education. Now I know yeah. NIADA disseminates that, but really it's about, you know, seeking and, and, you know, sourcing the education that's out there. And then we talked about the compliance piece, you know, that's part of the training and that's part of what the association does as well as anybody's to, to help navigate that compliance piece, make that education available Absolutely. for folks, because that's also a threat, I think, to, especially to buy here, pay here, uh, dealers. We're, we're in a tough time, market conditions, cost of car, cost of fuel. It's a difficult time. Well, and the, the atmosphere in Washington toward entrepreneurs in general is caustic. Uh-huh. You know, you're, you're doing something. We don't know what you're doing. We don't understand it, but by gosh, we're going to catch you. And right. Oh, that's going to, and, and, you know, the F, the Federal Trade Commission has always been very cooperative with, with NIEDA. They listen to us. Right. CFPB, well, that's a relationship we've had to really work to establish. Mm-hmm. But it is making a turn at a time where the leadership of CFPB is really, really laser focused mm-hmm. on collections issues and things of that nature. Mm-hmm. And yet when they have a question, they call and ask us. Yeah. Sure. And it's it's so important to have that relationship yeah, and absolutely. have somebody that's got your back as your yeah. dealer. Yeah. And I, I really appreciated some of Bob's comments about that as well, is that, you know, he's spent some time in Washington and he's like, all oh, these people really have um, interest of the, con- I mean, they have good intentions. They just may not be aligned with your good intentions. And so what they've been working so hard is to make sure that they see what, the industry's good intentions are and maybe creates an op, uh, an environment where they can start to align those good intentions. So often in a Washington environment, I, I, I sincerely believe in the, even the folks that I'd never consider voting with all, for all mm-hmm. the tea in China, they still have good intentions mm-hmm. and they, they may not be well, well thought out. They may not have all the facts. And that's mm-hmm. where an association like ours comes into play Amen. where we can add the facts and explain to them a perfect example. You know, there've been efforts and in, in NIADA is really, really got this squashed and, and they're helping dealers in this way, but there, there have been you know issues on, on vehicle recalls. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and they don't think about the fact, well, everything's got to be perfectly safe. We can't have 14 out of a million break down. Someone might have a problem. Well, yeah, but if you take a million vehicles out of inventory and park them for six months, look at the economic ramifications of that, not mm-hmm. only for the, the business owner, but in tax revenue and, mm-hmm. and so it's like, okay, trade? we get, we need to do this. Yeah. Let's figure out a plan to make it work for let's, everybody. Let's see the big yeah. picture. You're not off chart in terms of what you want to accomplish, but you've got to find a better way to do so. And, and NID has been a very effective mm-hmm. voice in that regard. And I, Brett Scott in particular, she really should get a call out because he, he got us in those meetings and he's there in Washington full time and it's, it's making a difference. Right. Yeah. And Michelle and I are trying to make sure at every turn, everybody we speak to that they know that we're, we're, We're trying to leave this industry better than we found it. We're happy to contribute at national level, state level, Mm -hmm. wherever we can help to to make sure that dealers can find the resources that they need and get plugged in. And so we might just start to shift to the conversation to those things about strengths and opportunities. And within that conversation, we'll talk about what's happening in terms of the digital shift 
you know, with, um, with car buying and how that affects buy here, payer. And if we view that as a threat or an opportunity. So yes. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> so I, here's, here's how I view it. And, and, you know, uh, you're, you're in a marketplace. I think I mentioned before your, 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 your objective is to provide enough value to your customer that they will happily freely give you their money in order to mm-hmm. have transportation. And there are a lot of pieces in that. There are some fundamental things that do not change. Mm-hmm. Dealership accounting. There's only so many ways that you can account for the cost of a sale and the sales tax and on all, you know, how your repair orders went on all that. Um, person to person relationships, I believe are another. Yeah. Until the customer can trust you and you're transparent enough, they can see what you're doing and feel good about it. They're not as likely to transact business with you. One of the things that I'm against would be, a, you know, and I see it all the time in, in articles and so forth, is a 30-minute sales transaction. It's almost impossible to make a good decision on the second largest purchase you're ever going to make in 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. So that you know, I'm, I'm more an advocate for slowing it down, being transparent, making certain the customer verifies that they're getting what they want and they're happy about it. On the other hand, in a, in a market that changes, and it's always been this way, in 1946 when this whole thing got started in IADA, the marketplace was this. Mm-hmm. And then somebody came along and started offering financing. And so then it changed and, it and then it was, you know, and it's this, the marketplace is forever evolving and you cannot stop that. You've got to jump on the train and, and find your place on it. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that you've got to spend oodles of money on doing Google or Facebook or, or, you know, setting your DMS up so that you can sell so many in California a car, but you need to be aware of it. And you need it as an entrepreneur, as a really intelligent business person, you need to figure out how you fit into that. And what is an advantage and what doesn't make sense for your business? Yeah. When you say your business, I always say that, and buy here, pay here, we, and, and this is tricky because you're talking about gray areas in, in our business and, and that gets you in trouble in compliance. But I, I wrote articles years ago about it's important for us to retain some degree of subjectivity in buy here, pay here. We need to be able to make those quick digital decisions, but you also have all this stuff on the perimeter that will be a factor before we step into a three-year business relationship with someone or now four, four and a half year relationship, you maybe, <laughs> you know, so now it's like, um, you know, what's that look like and how do we maintain that degree of subjectivity where we can see what it is we need to see to make sure the customer's a good fit for our program. Cause at the end of the day, it is our program. It is our money. We're providing that funding. So Jim, I think here's, this is something that, and you're right. It's a, it's a delicate dance. Mm-hmm. All right. But if you think about it, There's nothing that we do as buy here, pay here dealers that the bank couldn't do. Mm -hmm. They choose not to. Okay. They don't trust that person. They don't want to go to the effort of collecting on a weekly basis Mm -hmm. or making phone calls. Right. Uh, They want to go Mm -hmm. golfing. Uh They want to get off at one (laughs) o'clock and take you golfing so that they can make a big deal someday down the road or at least tell their boss they had customer client contact. Okay. But we're in a business where we're taking advantage of what they won't do. Okay. Yeah. The question is who's in business taking advantage of things that we won't do? That's yeah. what you need to always constantly look at. Yeah, right? and it's 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 been a really interesting as a novice, um, a beginner in this whole industry is that I hear um, rumblings of uh, that the the banking and the banking the larger lenders are are looking at subprime and they're going to yeah. dip their toe in there and and I've talked to Jim and he's like they've done it before and they will do it again because once they dip their toe in it will be a short stint before they realize wait a second this is When we were in our franchise world, we had a lot of secondary folks that we worked with as well. And if it didn't work, they, we put folks with buy here, pay here. And a lot of them just prefer to be a buy here, pay here to begin with. Mm-hmm. But I just for fun, oh, these couple of years ago, I took up, I, I opened up a, a desk drawer that still had all the files in it. Uh-huh. And I took a snap of all these where you could see the lenders and who they were, you know, and mm-hmm. stuck it on Facebook. Man, I got laughed. So oh, I remember those guys. I, they were in, they were out, they were in, they were out. Mm-hmm. And that's true. And you've, you've gone through a period now where you, you know, there's, you had the subprime bubble. There's mm-hmm. still a little bit of it out there. Things are pretty good. Money was good. You know, they all mm-hmm. jump right in. And if you stop and think about it, their value proposition is worse than ours. They're charging higher interest rates than the many buy here, pay here deals do. Mm-hmm. They're charging longer terms because the play is not making money on the car. The play is making money on the interest. Mm-hmm. And that's not beneficial to the consumer. I, I can make that argument of somebody who's sitting in front of me, no problem. Okay. But to your point, when when they math that out and the delinquencies are mm-hmm. rising, and I, I read an article this morning in Ottawa News that delinquencies are on their eyes, they bail. 
and now our customers need us. And, yeah. and it's an excellent opportunity to sit down and go, hey, look, I know you did this. And if you stop and think about it, they financed you for 72 months at 24%. And the interest charge was 21 grand. Now look at my contract. The interest is 3,200. We're going to pay this thing off and you get another one in two years. Mm-hmm. And now you can make, you, you can you can really truly get a permanent customer because you're creating better value than the other guy did. And I think one of the intangibles in that, that doesn't get talked about enough, it's because it's hard to measure, is this idea that, you know, you talk about they're providing a service or a, they're providing funding at a rate, but there's no relationship there. Like we're, when you're a local dealer, you provided the financing, you are also supporting or servicing the account and handling the collections, then that relationship continues. So you're continuing to provide value, whereas the lender just provided money on the front end. A lot Fundamentally, of Jim, there are, there are two ways to do business. And I, I've known this for years and we've always chosen the latter, but um, you can be transactional. Mm-hmm, and, right. you know, you've always, you see these new car, I sell a car for forty nine ninety five over invoice, you know, mm-hmm. a great deal. And they're out of business later on. Mm-hmm. And if the, if the service stunk, right. they, the relationship came apart just as fast as it came together. Sure. You know, the, the, the flip side of that is, and this is the way my dad taught me, that's how we ran our Chrysler store. Mm-hmm. We had people coming 50 miles away for, for service and everything else is relationship, hundred mm-hmm. percent relationship. Where do you get value? Where do you drive value? Right. You know, mm-hmm. and in, in my store, and we're, we're tiny by here, Peter. I have not run, I do have a website. Okay. That's it. I have not run an advertisement since 2003. Wow. Yeah. It's so most of it. It's referral repeat and referral. repeat. Mm-hmm. The first people I ever sold a car to by here, pay here in October of, of 1992 are still customers. And so are their kids and their grandkids are shopping. Yeah. That's excellent. We, uh, unfortunately we're running out of time. I can see people are filtering in the room and we still got a little bit of AV stuff to set up for our, Next session. Can so we, we get you on the show? Some and like once we get home, it's like uh, nine a.m. is not that bad. No, <laughs> he's uh, eight central. Eight, right? so, yeah, yeah, you are central. Yeah. Um, if if you're willing, we'd love to have you on and just you know just banter about some of the things that are are uh, the news of the day and all sure. of that. And the future would love that. So so, so I, much to talk about. A lot of fun. We enjoy yeah. having you here. So thanks for making time to. Uh, to step in with us, and uh, we know that our, our listeners will enjoy well, all this future. Can I throw one more thing at you? I, yes. you? You alluded earlier, and I didn't really answer your question well, but um, you talked about the state of the, the board and NIDA and so mm-hmm. forth. I want everybody out there to know we have an excellent CEO. This guy yeah. took a strategic plan that had basically been shelved and brought it back out and worked with the board to recreate it. It's a mm-hmm. five-year plan, and we're about two years into it. And I think sometimes dealers get a little frustrated because things aren't happening fast enough. We all want it like Trump mm-hmm. time next week. It'd be great. You know? <laughs> and, and, but they're working at it and, and the board is not a country club. It's, it's a work group. Mm-hmm. And we've got committees and things going on all the time with regard to things that will benefit dealers. That is the yeah. focus. And I'm, I'm super proud to be a part of that. And I can tell you that Jim and Michelle over here, we see the benefit, we see the results of that effort. And so, yeah, we would invite dealers to uh, get involved. And we've shared that we're happy to plug in and be a resource and anything that the association is doing, we want to try to help. So, Absolutely. So, yeah, that's. Thank uh, you. I'll, I'll talk to Bob Omo so you can get, uh, we'll get you on a couple of committees. Oh, I'd, uh, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, we're going to close now and uh, we'll have this up on the, the, uh, YouTube before the end of the day today. And then all, all of the, uh, the, um, social podcast, channels. social Outstanding. channels. Well, well. I, you know, I know it's a morning show. So y'all have a great day. Thanks. Yeah. You too. Yeah. We'll talk Thanks. to you later. Bye-bye.